Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netroomsradio.com Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Some of the Republican senators who voted against convicting Trump, um, somewhat oddly, I don't know, uh, somewhat in, in a somewhat contradictory or awkward way, um, chose to pair their vote to acquit Trump with scathing statements about how convinced they were of Trump's guilt <laughs> and how really someone Anyone, anyone but them, um, ought to really hold Trump accountable for these terrible things that he is guilty of. Senator Rob Portman of Ohio, for example, voting to acquit former President Trump and then releasing a statement saying, quote, what President Trump did that day was inexcusable. Quote, in his speech, he encouraged the mob. Quote, his slow response as the mob stormed the U.S. Capitol put at risk the safety of Vice President Pence, law enforcement officers, and others who work in the Capitol. Even after the attack, some of the language in Trump's tweets and in a video showed sympathy for the violent mob. This is a statement from Rob Portman, right? Sounding like it's a statement in support of his vote to convict. Right? He's saying Trump is definitely guilty. <laughs> but this is actually the statement he put out to explain his vote to acquit him. Release the statement about how guilty Trump is in all these different ways. But then interestingly, he actually concludes that statement by saying that he thinks Trump should be criminally charged. Rob Portman this weekend, quote, the Constitution makes clear that former presidents are subject to the criminal justice system. That is where the issues raised by the president's inexcusable actions and words must be addressed. The criminal justice system must be employed to address Trump's inexcusable behavior and his culpability for the violent attack on the Capitol, says Senator Rob Portman. Raise your hand if you think that if the Justice Department brought federal criminal charges against President Trump for what he did on January 6th, Senator Rob Portman would remember that he said this and stand loud and proud in support of the arrest and imprisonment of President Trump. Raise your hand if he'd stick to this, if the Justice Department actually did bring those charges. But that is what Senator Portman argued while also voting to acquit President Trump. And of course, he wasn't the only one. There's no question, none, that President Trump is practically and morally responsible for provoking the events of the day. No question about it. The people who stormed this building believed they were acting on the wishes and instructions of their president. Believe was a foreseeable consequence of the growing crescendo of false statements, conspiracy theories, and reckless hyperbole, which the defeated president kept shouting into the largest megaphone on planet Earth. 
The issue is not only the president's intemperate language on January 6th. It is not just his endorsement of remarks in which an associate urged, quote, trial by combat. It was also the entire manufactured atmosphere of looming catastrophe, the increasingly wild myths, myths about a reverse landslide election that was somehow being stolen, some secret coup by our now president. Anyone who decries his awful behavior is accused of insulting millions of voters. That's an absurd deflection. 74 million Americans did not invade the Capitol. Hundreds of rioters did. 74 million Americans did not engineer the campaign of disinformation and rage that provoked it. One person did, just one. President Trump is still liable for everything he did while he was in office as an ordinary citizen, unless the statute of limitations is run, still liable for everything he did while he's in office. Didn't get away with anything yet. Yet. We have a criminal justice system in this country. We have civil litigation. And former presidents are not immune from being accountable by either one. It is Tuesday, the 16th of February of 2021. And you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef, working quite hard at it, too. And our daily special is... Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays, a small, scant dash, a mere pinch of hot, smoked Hungarian paprika, will make all the difference in the world. Well, here it is Tuesday, and it looks like uh, the gaslighting will uh, be increasing as each day goes on. You thought we were going to have a rest. Joe's taking over, and everything's going to be hunky-dory. Nope. They're ramping it up. We're already hearing calls to impeach Kamala. Why is it that they always go after the black ladies? I mean, just black in general, but a black woman, Lindsay? Why do you always attack women, and especially women of color? Why would you do that, Mr. Southern Man? Anyway, uh, we got that going. Uh, Gaslighting that Nancy planned or had something to do with uh, the storming of the Capitol. It's her fault. You know, this gaslighting BS just kills me. Uh, Let's just, you know, I don't believe when anyone says, oh, well, she had control over whether the National Guard would get there, not the president. Bullshit. It's D.C., okay? And uh, the Capitol Police, in a certain way, answered to nobody. But let's just get Trump out of the equation here and just talk about the Congress having control over the Capitol Police and why didn't they do their job and why didn't the Congress, Nancy in particular, look at them. And as uh, David mentioned earlier, totally ignoring the fact that Mitch McConnell is in that equation too. So one way to, uh, I suppose, mitigate that is to set up a 9-11 style commission and investigate it wholly. I hope that's the case, because I got to say, a lot of stuff that uh, GW did got kind of buried. We never got to hear about it. Oh, I'm sorry. That's redacted. Okay, great. (laughs) But we know we saw everything in real time. These people are trying to even Hannity. Well, I guess that's not surprising. But Hannity is going on with this conspiracy theory. Blame Nancy. Blame Nancy. It's the blame Nancy crowd, you know? Blame Hillary. Blame Nancy. Blame Kamala. Blame the blame the squad. Scary women. And they're even scarier if they're of color. Wow. Uh, of course, right now, uh, the big bad witch is 
Nancy Pelosi. They need a witch to burn at the stake. That's what they've become. Well, I wouldn't say that's what they've become. That's really what they've been for quite a while. But now it's manifested into a monster they have no control over. And I'm not sure they want to control it. I think they're having fun with it. Boy, are we in deep trouble. How is it that we allowed ourselves... Well, on the other hand, we got to stop blaming ourselves. And you know who we are. Because there is one ideology, one party that was susceptible to brainwashing, and one that wasn't. And somehow we're the enemy of the state. No kidding. A hostile state. We're the enemy of your hostile state. A peaceful transfer of power was not only obstructed, but a violent insurrection, a coup, was attempted in the halls of Congress. Donald Trump didn't do anything in hopes that a mob would kill his vice president. And he's not going to be held to account? Now, that's some heavy Stockholm Syndrome there. One party, one ideology is susceptible to the brainwashing. But I got to tell you, both parties better not be falling to this Stockholm Syndrome BS. I keep telling everybody, if you just want to look forward and, and don't look behind and just keep moving forward, someone's going to stab you in the back. It keeps happening over and over and over. And at the top, that is, it's emblematic of this whole argument. Does anyone believe for one moment that as soon as law enforcement gets involved, as soon as a 9-11 commission uh, uh, releases their report, that's going to be uh, canceled. It'll be a cancel culture. The repugs will want to cancel it. Oh, no, we can't let people see that. But when law enforcement actually attempts to charge, I, I would also say maybe even investigate Trump. Every single repug who said, oh, we, we can't impeach. We have to let law enforcement do its job. They're going to be in the forefront saying you can't do that. And as I mentioned yesterday, it'll be some sort of weird implied immunity argument. Russ never sleeps. It's corrosive. We have to work every day and rub it out. And I got to say, we have a really rusty nation right now with a lot of corrosive elements who vote. How do we change their minds? Apparently, even an ice storm that uh, shows the weakness of an unregulated power grid in Texas isn't enough. Squeaky Berbert is out making these proclamations. It's all a socialist plot. Socialism doesn't work. They have these rolling blackouts. That's because of the new Green Deal. I, what the F, Squeaky? What new Green Deal are you talking about? Where in our government is the new Green Deal? I'm trying to figure it out. What policy of the new Green Deal are we seeing that's taken over the fossil fuel industry? Texas only touts itself as the energy hub of the world. You know, the nation, if not the world. My snoozing sous chef is working. I don't know if you can tell. Anyway, uh, she's uh, out there uh, blaming the squad. Blaming Biden, the socialist. Oh, God. Any, I know I'm rambling a bit, but it's, it's a lot of touchstones to touch upon. But anybody who calls Joe Biden a socialist is a neo-Nazi fascist. That might be redundant, but I think it might encompass the whole. If you're so far to the right, you think Joe Biden is a socialist, I would probably check out your Nazi coat from the cloakroom. Put it on. Well, you know what? They're not afraid to. They're doing it right now in our faces, daring us. Why can't we decertify 
folks from running for office, whole parties. You know, it is, you have to remember, I'm sure that my audience does because we're of age. But there were no parties in the inception of this nation. When the articles of impeachment were written, it wasn't uh, written with the idea of factions. That was supposed to be anathema back in the day. You know, original intent and all. The kind of partisan politics that plays out today is exactly what the founders were trying to avoid, and that's why they didn't like parties. Didn't take us very long. Yeah, I know, there were some parties before Washington died. (laughs) Tried to be. But uh, it really took off after. So uh, we get these process arguments, like McConnell at the top, finally calling Trump out. Well, is he going to remember one word that he said? He's going to be in the forefront saying, oh, presidential implied immunity. Yeah, while they're trying to impeach Kamala Harris for something she never did. She bailed out a a, a person who assaulted. Yeah, a Willie Horton moment. We got a Willie Horton Horton moment on our hands now, huh? My God. And people are falling for it. Just like they fell for the lie about the Mueller report. It was a Russian hoax and Mueller uh, approved it. No, he didn't. That was Barr. Barr lied about the Mueller report and everybody remembers Barr's lie. So... uh, yeah, 9-11 commission. It only works if we know what the testimony is. If we even know what the results are. Recommendations. I they, they have subpoena power. I would like to see some sort of law enforcement power imposed somewhere along the, the process. I'm not talking about putting underlings in jail. There's going to be some people in a little bit more power than Lieutenant Kelly. That takes you back. I'm sure my audience who was of age would know what I speak of. Okay, since my snoozing sous chef is working so hard, we might as well get into uh, what we have offered for you today here. In West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. I should note also, roasted corn goes in my chowders. It's my, it's my chef conceit, indeed. Okay, on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, as we start off, House Republicans slam Joe Biden for using CDC guidelines to reopen the nation's schools. How dare he use science? How dare he? You know what an example of how elections have consequences the DHS can finally investigate far-right extremism after years of being blocked by Trump. Years! And the solar wind hack was the largest and most sophisticated hack the world has ever seen. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where Vice President Kamala Harris spoke to French President Emmanuel Macron, expressing commitment to strengthening bilateral ties between the two countries. And that's a good thing. And Nozi Kono Ewela made history by becoming the first woman and first African director general of the World Trade Organization. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Page at netrootsradio.com. To the right of the page is the chat room link, and our chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. 
to the left of that chat room link near the bottom of our homepage at netroomsradio.com. Hopefully you'll notice the link to our Patreon page. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, and possibly, maybe, could you send us the equivalent of an espresso-type coffee drink once a month, if those funds were sent to us in that form, not as a coffee drink, of course, but the funds, then we stretch those dollars beyond compare. We pay our bills and uh, fly under the radar and continue what we've been doing for all the last almost 10 years. And we have you to thank for doing that. Though the bulk of how we do this comes out of our own wallets, we would still truly be unable to do it without you. And your generosity has sustained us in fulfilling our civic duty as the founders originally intended. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, Tom takes care of it, and find Netroots Radio at Netroots Radio. Thanks, Tom. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I take uh, I post the show notes and links diary about 10 minutes before showtime. Get that posted up on Twitter and other social media platforms because that's what you do. And you can follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts, please, by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and really wherever podcasts can be found. All righty. Why don't we tuck into this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. Yes, roasted corn goes into the chowders. That's how I like to do it. You know, another thing I like to do is uh, sometimes uh, I'll roast the corn and then I'll soak them in uh, lime water. You know, like fresh lime. Uh, some people like to use lemon, but I, I, I like to do the lime thing. It's it's uh, very subtle, a little bit more light. And corn is naturally sweet, and when you roast it, it brings out the sweetness and the acid. is just a, a nice way of, well, on the chemical level, it breaks down membranes, too, and just makes it, um, to me, a more tasty meal, very subtle. All right, enough of that. This first offering comes out of the American Independent by Donna Provencher. Republican lawmakers are criticizing President Joe Biden for approaching the reopening of schools during the coronavirus pandemic in accordance with the new guidelines released by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Well, since they destroyed it, they thought, well, it doesn't have any more credibility. Why is he going after them? Why? On February 12th, the CDC released new guidelines setting masks and six feet of social distancing as top priorities for the safe reopening of schools. Expanded screening for the coronavirus and, when necessary, hybrid teaching, both in person and online, should also be available, the guidelines say. Vaccinating teachers could act as an additional layer of protection. Yeah, I think if I was a teacher, I'd like to be vaccinated. I mean, just generally. It's a cesspool. It's a petri dish of of disease. Everybody knows that. You have a kid? You'll know that. And uh, vaccinating teachers, said uh, CDC Director Rochelle Walensky, uh, would not be mandatory before reopening. Because if they did, that would mean that they cave to the teachers' union. Can't have that. Not in a pandemic. While the guidelines note that in many cases it is safe for students to return to school for in-person learning, they also emphasize that knowing the rate of community spread is critical in determining whether schools in a given area can safely open. Venture brings this article also to us here in the Bistro Cafe at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and she does work at the American Independent. 
Joe Biden's administration is expanding new grants from the Department of Homeland Security to target and prevent right-wing, right-wing domestic terrorism after years of such efforts being effectively stymied by Donald Trump. And the department is ramping up its plans to combat what experts say is the greatest terrorist threat facing America today. According to an NBC report, although the department's Office of Targeted Violence and Terrorism Prevention originally directed some funding to these grants toward the end of Trump's time in office, Biden's plan expands upon the funding available, which will include more than 500000 allocated toward American University to study the growing threat of violent white supremacist extremist information. Only half a mil? Huh. DHS, which in 2019 founded the Office for Targeted Violence and Terrorism Prevention to prevent violent political extremism, is expected to continue to receive more funding from Congress during the Biden administration. Wow, I guess they didn't really do a good job about stopping all those fascists then, huh? You know why? Because you can't find the Antifa uh, club president on any college campus anywhere in America. Anywhere. Turning Point USA? Oh, yeah. They got cutouts of Charlie Kirk. Officials say the Trump administration effectively hamstrung the department from enacting real efforts to halt right-wing extremist violence. Trump and his administration frequently placed blame for domestic terrorist violence on Antifa and civil rights activist groups like Black Lives Matter instead of on actual right-wing perpetrators. At the first televised presidential debate on September 29th, moderator Chris Wallace asked Trump if he would denounce right-wing extremist violence from the stage. Sure, I'm prepared to do that, Trump answered. Well, actually, he sneered. I would say almost everything I see is from the left wing, not from the right wing. I'm willing to do anything. I want to see peace. You know, whenever they say they want to see peace, they want to make sure you are torn to pieces. He then told the far right white supremacist group, the Proud Boys, to stand back and stand by, adding, but I'll tell you what, somebody's got to do something about Antifa and the left, because this is not a right wing problem. This is a left wing problem, because when you're a fascist, yeah, everything's going to be a left wing problem in the first eight months of 2020, 67 percent of attacks on American soil by political extremists, were committed by right-wing domestic terrorists. And that's according to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. The CSIS database also notes that since 2010, almost six times as many Americans have been murdered by right-wing extremists as left-wing extremists. Since 1994, not a single murder has been linked to Antifa activists. In February of 2020, a report by the Anti-Defamation League found, though, that 90% of extremist-related murders in the U.S. in 2019 were committed by right-wing extremists. But experts tried for years to investigate the threat posed by right-wing domestic terrorists under Trump, only to find themselves repeatedly stonewalled by Trump and his administration. Two former Justice of Department or Department of Justice officials told the New York Times that they were pressured to uncover a left wing violent conspiracy plot that did not exist. And top DHS officials denied funding for more analysts to flag right wing threats of violence on social media in the election's aftermath. Far-right extremists felt they had an ally in the White House, according to Mary McCord, a former DOJ employee and Georgetown University professor specializing in domestic terrorism. That has, I think, allowed them to grow and recruit and try to mainstream their opinions, which is why I think you end up seeing what you saw at the Capitol, really. Elizabeth Newman, former DHS Sec- Assistant Secretary for Counterterrorism and Threat Prevention, told NBC that even 
use of the term domestic terrorism in department meetings with Trump was discouraged in favor of broader terms like violence prevention. We did expand domestic terrorism prevention under Trump, she said, but when it came to questions of how we could change the domestic terrorism statute to charge people more easily, there were no adults in the White House who were, who were willing to go there, nor was anyone willing to define the threat. Anonymous Reuters staff brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A hacking campaign that used a U.S. tech company as a springboard to com compromise a raft of U.S. government agencies is, quote, the largest and most sophisticated attack the world has ever seen, end quote. Microsoft Corporation President Brad Smith said, the operation, which was identified in December, and that the U.S. government has said was likely orchestrated by Russia, breached software made by SolarWinds Corp, giving hackers access to thousands of companies and government offices that used its products. The hackers got access to emails at the U.S. Treasury, Justice and Commerce Departments, and other agencies. Cybersecurity experts have said it could take months to identify the compromised systems and expel the hackers. I think from a software engineering perspective, it's probably fair to say that this is the largest and most sophisticated attack the world has ever seen, Smith said during an interview on Sunday on the CBS program, 60 Minutes. The breach could have compromised up to 18,000 SolarWind customers that use the company's Orion network. And that's a monitoring software and likely relied on hundreds of engineers. When we analyzed everything that we saw at Microsoft, we asked ourselves how many engineers have probably worked on these attacks. And the answer we came to was, well, certainly more than a thousand. U.S. Intel Services said last month that Russia was likely behind the SolarWinds breach, which they said appeared to be aimed at collecting intelligence rather than destructive acts. Of course, Russia has denied responsibility for the hacking campaign because they always do. All right, that takes us to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Jason Goldman. And they'll basically crush or pop the head off of any worker who tries to attack them. If you're a honeybee, a hornet attack could be the last thing you ever experience. It's a gory, violent process, and honeybees have had to adapt to stay alive. You've probably heard of those murder hornets that recently turned up in North America. This is not a story about those. This research takes us east to meet their cousins. 
Wellesley College biologist Heather Madela went to Vietnam to understand how Asian honeybees defend themselves from the hornets there. And in Vietnam, that's the giant hornet uh, Vespasor. Typically, when a hornet invades an Asian honeybee hive, hundreds of bees surround the intruder and create what's called a heat ball. With the hornet caught in the center, the heat goes up and the oxygen goes down. The bees literally cook and choke the hornet to death. But Vespa Soror has figured out a way to avoid this trap. Giant hornets will hunt honeybees on their own and grab them one by one. But what is really lethal to honeybees is when they flip into a multiple hornet attack strategy. And when they do this, they essentially want to kill all the adult defenders so that the colony is no longer protected. But in the face of this deadly bum rush, Asian honeybees have resorted to the scatological. And a lot of the beekeepers hadn't noticed them, or if they had, they didn't know what they were. But there was a handful of beekeepers who had seen these spots. Those spots, it turned out, were poop. The hive's decision to dip into the dung pile didn't come lightly, though. The alternative to covering their house in shit was annihilation of the colony in the face of an overwhelming giant hornet invasion. And then at a certain point, the workers in the colony decide it's it's a lost cause and they'll abandon ship and everyone will leave, and that leaves the entire colony undefended. So at that point, the hornets can successfully, without any interference, break into the nest and occupy it. And when they take over a nest, what they do is ferry the bee larvae inside back to their own hornet larvae so that they can eat them. One beekeeper told Madela and her colleagues that he had seen the honeybees collecting bits of water buffalo dung. He thought that might explain the spots. He thought the bees might be using the dung to keep the hornets away. We confirmed that bees actually forage on dung, which is a surprise in itself. Honeybees generally keep their nests clean and tidy. They're good at keeping diseases and pathogens out. Two things that could be hiding in animal poop. And the thought of them collecting feces in the field and intentionally bringing it back home was pretty stunning. Whenever they detected a giant hornet nearby, but not other smaller hornets, the honeybees began to arrange bits of mammal or bird dung near the entrances to their hives. And the hornets themselves were less likely to land on a nest adorned with poop. If they did bother to land, they spent 94% less time attempting to break in. The study was published in the December 9 issue of the journal PLOS One. The researchers say this is the first time honeybees have ever been documented collecting non-plant matter. And because the bees are selective in what kind of poop they collect, and use it in a very specific way, they say it actually qualifies as tool use, the first known instance in wild bees. It isn't clear why or how the poop shield works. But Madela suspects that there must be some chemical inside the poop, presumably derived from the plants that the animals originally ate, that either actively repels the hornets or camouflages the scent of the bees' nests. American bees don't do this. Asian honeybees are a different species than the Western honeybees in Europe and North America. I just can't even totally capture how much fun it really was to do this work. I didn't have a lot of personal experience with Asian bees, and so meeting them was kind of like meeting the crazy cousin of the bees you know really well. These bees are a lot smaller, but they're very, very fast and very reactive. And that's because of the kind of hornet pressure that they've evolved under. They have evolved to fly quite quickly in zigzagging patterns as they're approaching their nest so that they're very hard to catch. Western honeybees did not evolve alongside hornets, as did their Asian cousins which makes them especially susceptible to hornet attacks in places where giant hornets become introduced. If Madela and her team can figure out how poop keeps hornets away, it might help North American beekeepers help their bees to survive, if the so-called murder hornets decide they like it here. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Jason Goldman. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Colorectal cancer is the number two cancer killer of men and women in the United States, but it is preventable. Early on, 
colorectal cancer typically has no symptoms. It starts with a precancerous polyp or abnormal growth in the colon, which can be removed without surgery. Several tests are available to find these polyps, so they can be removed before they turn into cancer. Screening also finds colorectal cancer early when treatment works best. Recommended screening for adults at average risk begins at age 50 and continues until age 75. Learn about screening test options and find out which tests are covered by insurance. Talk to your health care provider about when you should be screened and discuss the best tests for you. For more information about colorectal cancer prevention, please visit cdc.gov slash vital signs. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. I'm probably okay to have one more drink before I drive home. I'm probably okay. I open the window to stay alert. Probably okay. I just popped some gum in my mouth. Step out of the car, please. I probably made a mistake. Probably okay isn't okay when it comes to drinking and driving. If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzz driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetRootsRadio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution and you'll get a wondrous pair of Netroots radio stickers for application to your backpack, your bumper sticker, or your banjo. Well, it's up to you which backpack you want to put it on. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetrootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Could a senator who believed that Donald Trump incited the insurrection at the Capitol also vote against impeachment? I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. Moments after Senator Mitch McConnell voted to acquit Donald Trump, he stood on the Senate floor and said this. January 6th, American citizens attacked their own government. They beat and bloodied our own police. They stormed the Senate floor. They tried to hunt down the Speaker of the House. They built a gallows and chanted about murdering the vice president. They did this because they had been fed wild falsehoods by the president. There is no question that President Trump is practically and morally responsible for provoking the events of that day. Notwithstanding these conclusions, Senator McConnell had voted against impeachment claiming that because Trump no longer held office, he could not be impeached. That's a position that most constitutional scholars disagree with and that the Senate had rejected with its 55 to 45 vote against the motion to dismiss. But Senator McConnell could assert this position and, of course, vote as he chose. That's because the Senate rules, while requiring the senators to take an oath that as jurors in an impeachment trial, they will, quote, do impartial justice according to the Constitution and laws, What that oath means, ultimately, is what any individual senator says it means. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU, because freedom can't protect itself. Welcome to 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. Abraham Lincoln tried to revive and renew political principles that defined America at its birth in 1776. At a speech in 1854 at Peoria, Illinois, Lincoln said, Let us readopt the Declaration of Independence, and with it, the practices and policy which harmonize with it. At Independence Hall in Philadelphia on February 22, 1861, Lincoln said, I have never had a feeling politically that did not spring from the sentiments embodied in the Declaration of Independence. Lincoln's understanding of American constitutionalism was based on principles expressed in the Declaration of Independence. 
He believed the Constitution was meant to fulfill the ideas of equality, liberty, and government by consent of the people in the 1776 founding document. In his actions as president and citizen, Lincoln attempted to preserve the founding political principles and to bring them more fully and justly into the lives of Americans. Thus, he began the process through which slavery was abolished in the United States. That's all for today's podcast. 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 2011. That was the day Madison public school teachers held a sick out in opposition to Governor Scott Walker's anti labor assaults. Walker had introduced Assembly Bill 11, later known as Act 10. This union busting bill proposed the elimination of collective bargaining rights for public sector workers regarding health and pension benefits, limited wage increases, eliminated dues collection. Election and mandated annual union recertification. Immediately, tens of thousands of protesters descended on the state capitol, chanting, Kill the bill, and took part in hearings to voice their opposition. Area schools remained closed for days as protests continued to grow throughout the spring. While parts of Act 10 have been ruled unconstitutional in the years since, the legislation has nonetheless wreaked havoc. A series in Milwaukee's Journal Sentinel titled Act 10. 10 at 5 examined how public school teachers have fared since the Madison uprising. They found that 75% of school districts are losing teachers, retirements have surged, less are entering the profession, and most job hop to the highest salary offers. The teachers' unions report major losses. MTEA notes that membership is down 30%. WEAC reports that membership and dues collection were cut in half. Seniority rights have evaporated and layoffs are increasingly tied to performance. Annual salary growth has slowed, stopped, or reversed. Teacher morale is low in many districts. Teachers often complain of additional unpaid duties, larger class sizes, and more performance reviews. There are new restrictions. On attire, as well as speech and political activities. If there is any good news, it is that unions survive annual recertification and remaining members are more active and more engaged in union work. This is Solidarity News on Radio Labor. This is a Radio Labor report recorded on Tuesday, February 16th, 2021. I'm Mark b o l a n c h i k The need for continuous development of skills amongst workers has become even more crucial as the pandemic changes the world of work drastically. In order to better understand what labor unions can do to help this skills development, the Workers' Activities Bureau of the United Nations International Labor Organization held a global webinar. The Bureau operates under its French acronym ACTREV. One of the participants in the webinar was Martin Henry. Mr. Henry is a research officer with Education International, the global union for teachers and other educators. He raised a central question about how workers will be able to develop their employment skills as the pandemic continues on. If in the time of COVID we're talking about access via the internet and via ICT and those sorts of ways to innovative practice, How are we going to develop the whole of the world and the whole of the workers' population? There are equity issues in that that we have to resolve. And I'm working in Africa as we have been intensively over the past couple of months. Those questions in the education system are huge as well, where you've had many students who've not been at school. How do we connect them back into the system of working out how to develop their skills in a broad sense? And how we get them connected to a whole life of learning so that they're going to be able to continue to grow and continue to think in this way. Unions also need to be involved in shaping the needs of workers and workers shaping their understanding because it's not a one way street. There has to be a negotiation between union management and workers on the shop floor about how those skills are changing and shifting. And They may also have requirements that are personal 
that are about developing skills outside of the workplace and are connected to their communities and their ability to support and be engaged in sustainability issues, environmental issues, issues across a broader picture. We've also got to be clear that the knowledge that needs to be delivered in terms of the skills that are applicable in the workplace must be delivered by trained professionals. There are, of course, unions who are able to do that job. Now, I include unions as educators because they're trained professionals in their understanding of what the worker is experiencing and how the worker is responding. And when we talk about the barriers that have been thrown up, they're multifarious. I've already referred to the equity issue and the issue of access and internet, which must be overcome. There's also a fractured global infrastructure that must be brought together in a more cohesive way. And we've seen in the last few months, in, in very clear and no uncertain terms, that a drive away from collaboration and cooperation across countries and between people is not going to help us either in facing COVID or in facing the challenges that skills changes are bringing to us. I think our ability to opt out of learning is disappearing. And there must be a way in which we recognize that as workers who take power in this question, that we must be central to the solution. To go back to my African colleague who said, we're not just troublemakers running round. We're actually the glue that will hold this economy together. And that's only going to happen through collaboration between all of us as unions in different areas that we're able to support each other. And as educators, we believe we've got a crucial role to play. We also believe that ILO has a crucial role to play. And we think that we should stiffen up the approach to lifelong learning by moving towards a lifelong learning guarantee. Because just saying we want it to happen doesn't mean that employers are going to get a magic wand out of their back pocket and all of a sudden start putting their hands in deep and pulling out the cash to enable workers to do those shifts. And that's it. International labor news you can't use. Thank you for listening. And remember, it's all about global solidarity. for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America where it is currently 39 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high of only about 45, uh, much cooler than yesterday. Cloudy early with peaks of sunshine late, winds light and variable. We have cl- our foggy conditions at the moment. A few clouds overnight with lows in the low to mid 30s, winds light and variable. Small chance of rain, though it is sprinkling a little bit right now. Mainly cloudy tomorrow, highs in the mid to upper 40s, winds light and variable, increasing chance of rain later on in the night, bringing about another quarter of an inch, and then we'll have more rain as the days go on. Confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County in the southern part of Oregon now stand at 7,861 with 106 deceased. Pollen is rated at none here in Rogue River proper. The air quality index for the southern Oregon region is good at 31 parts per million and the daytime UV index is moderate at 3. Barometric pressure is falling at 30.24 inches. Visibility is at a half mile. And relative humidity is at 95%. 
Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd of crowdsourcers crowdsource from around the world. London is 50 degrees and mostly cloudy. Paris is 53 and mostly cloudy. Rome is 51 and partly cloudy. Kiev is 12 degrees and fair. Sounds cold to me. Kabul is 47 degrees and fair. That seems a lot more fair than what uh, Kiev is at, at 12. Anyway, uh, Hong Kong is 61 and clear. Tokyo is 45 and clear. Sydney, Australia is 70 degrees and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 47 and partly cloudy. And New York, New York is 45 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd crowdsources from around the world. Reuters staff at Reuters brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris spoke to French President Emmanuel Macron yesterday, Monday, expressing her commitment to strengthening bilateral ties between the two countries, her office said in a statement. President Joe Biden, a former vice president himself, under Barack Obama, has had Harris at his side for multiple events during his early White House tenure, indicating he wants her to have a key role in implementing his political and policy agenda. The call with Macron, a leader of a G7 nation, shows Harris is taking a role in foreign policy as well, an area in which the former U.S. senator from California has significantly less experience than Biden. Vice President Harris and President Macron agreed on the need for close bilateral and multilateral cooperation to address COVID-19, climate change, and support democracy at home and around the world, the vice president's office said in a statement. Harris also spoke to Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau earlier this month in her first call as vice president with a foreign leader. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, reste toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Emma Farge and Andrea Shalal of Reuters brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Three months after the Trump administration rejected her, former Nigerian finance minister Ngozi okonjo Ewela received unanimous backing yesterday, Monday, to become the first woman and the first African director general of the World Trade Organization. A self-declared declared doer with a track record of taking on seemingly intractable problems, Okonia Awela will have her work cut out for her at the trade body, even with Trump, who had threatened to pull the U.S. out of the organization no longer in the White House. <laughs> 
as Director General, a position that wields limited formal power. Awela, age 66, will need to broker international trade talks in the face of persistent U.S.-China conflict, respond to pressure to reform trade rules, and counter protectionism heightened by the COVID-19 pandemic. She told Reuters in an interview that her top priority would be to ensure the trade body does more to address the COVID-19 pandemic, calling the disparities in vaccine rates between rich and poor countries unconscionable and urging members to lift restrictions on medical items. She also expressed confidence that her priorities were now aligned with Washington's indeed. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio will broadcast on. And we're going to meet up tomorrow for Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TF, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver